So this chapter is all about art's role in asking and answering life's fundamental questions. Where do we come from? What happens when we die? And what is our purpose? Artists often explore and examine the cycles of life, of both nature and humanity, dealing with difficult or unfathomable topics such as the beginnings of existence, the miracle of childbirth, natural cycles and the passage of time, and the overwhelming finality of death, or even the unknown of what lies beyond. Artists may explore these topics through both metaphorical or direct portrayals of life's beginnings, endings, and what happens in between. Stories about the creation of humanity and the beginnings of human society are found throughout history and cultures around the globe. Creation myths may or may not include deities or sacred beings, and they often reference forces of nature, such as the movements of the stars or flooding. And it is pretty common for destructive forces to be required for the creation of new life. For example, in the Hindu religion, creative and destructive forces symbolize the belief in reincarnation, which manifests itself as the cycle of life. One of the principal Hindu deities, Shiva, embodies the balancing of contradictory qualities or dualities within the universe. Uh, Shiva is both male and female, both benevolent and fearsome, and is considered the creator and destroyer or the giver and taker of life. As Nataraha, or the Lord of the Dance, Shiva is responsible for dancing the world into existence and generating samsara, or the endless cycle of death and rebirth, that is reincarnation. Um, this particular bronze sculpture, which was made using the lost wax casting technique, depicts just that. Shiva is shown dancing within the orb of the sun, tapping on a small drum to mark the cosmic rhythm of death and rebirth. The flames surrounding Shiva represent the periodic chaos and destruction that happens when the dance ceases. During Shiva's inactivity, fire cleanses the world and provides a release from samsara or reincarnation. So in other words, destruction interrupts the cycle, allowing it to begin anew. Here, Shiva is shown dancing on top of a demon dwarf that symbolizes how evil and ignorance are stamped out with his actions. Um, his one raised foot symbolizes liberation, and his front arms display a mudra or symbolic gesture that means have no fear. Over time, Shiva's dance creates a balance between the forces of creation and destruction, which results in the cycle of life. Now this particular sculpture was created in the 11th century and it was intended for ceremonial use. From the 11th century onward, Hindu devotees carried these types of sculptures in processional parades, followed by priests chanting prayers. The statue serves as a place for Shiva to rest so that he can be present for the ceremonial festivities. Um, so this was made to be carried and moved around, which sort of explains its moderate size. The holes in the base may have been used to help attach it to um, like a platform to make it a little bit easier to carry and manipulate. And sometimes sculptures such as these would be adorned with clothing, jewelry, or flowers, which during the procession would sort of emphasize the statue's movement, referencing the movements of Shiva's dance. The ancient Aztecs, a culture active from about 1300 to 1521 in the region of present-day central Mexico, also recorded their beliefs that the earth has to undergo cycles of both destruction and creation. This artwork is the Aztec Sunstone, also known as the Aztec Calendar Stone. It weighs about 24 tons and measures about 12 feet across, and it originally stood at the top of the main temple in Tenochtitlan, the capital city of the Aztec Empire, which stood in present-day Mexico City. Um, the stone would have originally been painted in shades of brown, red, white, blue, and green. Um, now, the Aztecs were quite skillful observers of the skies, and this shows their impressive astronomical and mathematical knowledge, but it also shows how the Aztecs marked the passage of time, and it depicts their beliefs about the cycles of life. So in the center, we see the sun god Tonatua with clawed hands that hold human hearts. 
the Aztecs made frequent human and animal sacrifices to the sun god to perpetuate the sun's continued movement. Um, you can kind of think about that as the giving of life in order to sustain life. Um, then in the four squares that surround the sun god, there are symbols that represent the four ways in which the earth was believed to have previously come to an end. So the Aztecs believed, and there is um, scientific evidence to prove that different eras of the earth's history ended in different forms of destruction. So there was an era that was ended with extreme winds, an era that ended with fire, one with floods, and one with wild beasts. Um, so all four of those symbols are represented in those squares there. The Aztecs believe that their current era or the fifth era would be destroyed by earthquake. Now surrounding those squares we have a ring of 20 animals each of which are framed by a small rectangle and these represent the days of the Aztec month. Priests would use this calendar stone to determine sacrificial periods, and such sacrifices, as well as the periods of disaster, were considered essential for creation and growth. The American artist Bill Viola's work, The Crossing, highlights the creative and destructive forces of water and fire. Both elements have the ability to renew, Water nourishes the land, and although it's initially destructive, fire has the potential to regenerate so that more can grow. They are also considered opposing destructive forces, and each may only be destroyed by the other. Um, in this artwork, The Crossing, two 57-foot high screens were placed facing each other on opposite walls within a dark enclosed space. Each screen simultaneously plays one of two 11-minute videos, and the viewer in the middle must decide which screen to watch. Both films begin in silence, with a man walking forward before stopping. On one screen, a single drop of water falls on the man's face, then more drops begin to fall, slowly leading to a torrential downfall that engulfs him. On the opposite screen, a small flame transforms into a roaring fire that also destroys the man. At the climax of the videos, the sound is deafening, and one wonders how the man could possibly withstand the ordeal. He's not screaming out in pain. He remains calm and still until he vanishes. Um, and so with this work, Viola is really trying to capture the cyclical and transformative power of nature and then link those cycles to the cyclical nature of human life as well. Artists have also depicted birth as a way of celebrating the existence of life forces whose beginnings are often hard to comprehend. Symbolically, the stages of life in human beings are frequently linked to weather seasons or cycles of farming. In many cultures, the creation of a human and the mother's role in carrying and birthing a child are often linked to planting and growth stages of crops. For the Aztecs, it was important to mark the physical, if still mystical, beginnings of human life. In Aztec culture, a woman giving birth was seen as a female warrior going to battle on behalf of the state. Women who died in childbirth were given the same respect as a man who might have died on the battlefield. They resided in the same final resting place as heroes, accompanying the sun on its daily journey through the sky. The goddess Tlatzotiotl, an earth mother and patron of childbirth, was known as the, quote, filth eater because she visited people at the end of their lives and absolved or ate their sins. Um, this stone sculpture of the goddess shows her in the act of giving birth to her daughter, um, Sintotil. She was the goddess of maize or of corn, which was the main crop that nourished the Aztec people. Um, without the earth mother suffering through childbirth, the maize god would not have been born. Um, it's also interesting to think about, again, this idea of cycles, um, because this goddess, again, is associated with childbirth, but she's also the goddess who comes to you at your moment of death to absolve you of your sins. So involved with creation and destruction, birth and death. 
Some more contemporary artists tend to focus on the stark realities of birth. For example, Dutch photographer Rene Dijkstra highlights some of these realities in her Mother's series. Um, this image, titled Julie, captures a mother and her newborn baby just one hour after delivery, at a time and in a way that defies most expectations of mother and child imagery. Um, the mother is standing against a cold, anonymous wall, and her position, kind of there holding her child, starkly exposes the vulnerability and even shock that both mother and child are probably feeling at this time. Um, Dijkstra was inspired by watching the birth of a friend's baby, and she said that she wanted to capture the awkwardness and the enduring strength of the early moments of new life. Um, she said that she wanted to make public a time in a woman's life that is now generally considered private and personal. The invention of time is one way that humanity has marked the cycles experienced in nature, the most obvious of which being the rotation of the earth around the sun. Although we have a standard understanding of time today, different cultures throughout history devised and utilized diverse systems. For example, Stonehenge, one of the most recognizable Neolithic monuments, which still receives millions of visitors each year, is surrounded by mystery. However, its circular arrangement and the way that certain stones align with the sunrise or sunset on the summer and winter solstices indicate that it was probably used as a giant calendar. So Stonehenge is located on Salisbury Plain in England and was built in phases between about 3200 and 1500 BCE. However, the site was used for hundreds of years before the stones were ever imported. A hinge is a circle, often made of stones, posts, or other materials, and typically surrounded by earthen embankments or ditches. Stonehenge is 106 feet in diameter and up to 20 to 25 feet tall in places. The earthen portions are the oldest parts of Stonehenge, and over the centuries, stones were imported and placed to create the monument that we know today. Massive sarsen stones weighing between 25 and 50 tons were imported from up to 23 miles away and arranged in a circle supporting a continuous lintel surrounding five huge trilithons or sarsen stone arches, which were created using a sort of post and lintel format. Um, and these trilithon arches form a horseshoe shape within that circle. On average, the stones of the circle are about 13 feet 6 inches tall, while the central trilithon, which is the tallest one, is about 24 feet tall with a lintel that is about 15 feet long and 3 feet wide. Um, smaller blue stones weighing about 5 tons each were imported from the Presley Mountains in Pembroke, South Wales, which is approximately 245 miles away from this site. Um, they were arranged within the circle as well. You can kind of see them. They're the smaller stones um, on the ground, the ones that are not upright. Um, but the monumental size and the high level of dedication to its construction really imply an extreme significance with this site. Um, it's believed that the original builders probably came from the West, bringing or retrieving those blue stones, perhaps as a form of connection to their past, their heritage, or their ancestors. While we may never know the true identity of the builders or how they accomplished such a feat, most scholars accept that, among other things, Stonehenge served as a giant observatory and calendar. The design seemingly corresponds to several astronomical events, including solstices, eclipse, stars, and moon cycles. The most readily accepted of which is the monument's alignment with the movements of the sun on the summer and winter solstices. So on the summer solstice, the sun rises precisely over the Great Heel Stone, a huge approximately 35 ton unworked stone that sits outside the circle to the northeast, which is framed by the open end of the horseshoe of Trilithons. 
Exactly opposite that point, at sunset on the winter solstice, the sun is framed by the uprights of the tallest sarsen trilithon at the head of the horseshoe. The arrangement of Stonehenge was likely to create an observatory or calendar to indicate agricultural seasons, but also maybe to keep track of important times of the year, to remember the dead, or to worship solar and lunar deities. The summer and winter solstices are the longest and shortest days of the year, marking the two great seasonal changes of the annual calendar. Now, the Neolithic peoples here were farmers, growing crops and tending livestock, so it would have been imperative to keep track of the planting and harvesting seasons. The summer solstice signaled the time to begin preparing for the fall harvest. However, archaeological evidence suggests that midwinter celebrations were maybe more important or sometimes larger. Um, now, why would they celebrate and gather here at midwinter? The nights are long and the days are cold, and after the bounty of summer and autumn, the stocks of food are beginning to dwindle. The ground is frozen solid and nothing seems able to grow. The sun's dim light barely scrapes above the horizon, and around the solstice, the sun seems to sort of stand still, its position in the sky barely moving at all. And that's plain to see, as people would have gathered at Stonehenge to watch the sunset between the Great Trilithon on, the, on that winter solstice. It might have seemed that the sun, the giver of light, warmth, and life, was dying. And then, thankfully, the sun excuse me, the sun starts to move northwards again after the winter solstice. And after a few days, it no longer rises between those two great stones. It's still cold, the nights are still long, but as the sun resumes its journey northward, it becomes clear that the days will get longer and the warmth will return. And the rebirth of the sun promises another year of life. So marking the solstices using the stones here was a way to sort of bring hope to these people that the warm weather, the longer days would return after the dark coldness of winter. Many ancient and prehistoric cultures made monumental sculptures that used the surface of the earth itself as a material. And often, kind of like Stonehenge, these monuments were related to the movements of the stars, the sun, the moon, etc. And therefore they helped to track um, the changing of the seasons and important times throughout the year. Um, for example, prehistoric artists of the Americas made one of the most prominent of these earthworks, um, which is the Great Serpent Mound near Locust Grove, Ohio. Now, as we can see from this aerial photo, the mound itself resembles a snake with its mouth open ingesting an egg. The identity of the people who created this mound is still hotly debated, um, but the head of the serpent and the egg are aligned to the position of the setting sun on the summer solstice, suggesting that the Great Serpent Mound was used again in making solar observations. Um, so this is similar to Stonehenge in a few ways. Rather than tracking the movements of the sun, the moon, the stars, and other astronomical events, some artists use their works to reflect the passage of time through the natural processes of growth and decay that organic materials undergo. Um, in the 1960s, many artists became increasingly interested in earthworks. And to a certain extent, they were taking perhaps some inspiration from ancient or prehistoric works like the Great Serpent Mound. However, they weren't necessarily trying to recreate these works or, or create them with the same sorts of meaning. Um, rather, they simply desired to explore the potential of landscape and environment as both material and site for their artwork. Um, and again, they wanted to sort of explore the temporary or ephemeral quality qualities of natural materials and how that sort of marks the passage of time. Um, so the best known modern earthwork is Robert Smithson's Spiral Jetty in the Great Salt Lake in Utah. Now Smithson chose a spiral 
a shape which is sort of naturally found in shells, crystals, galaxies, and other parts of nature. Um, the coiled artwork was made by dumping 6,550 tons of rock and dirt off of dump trucks, kind of gradually creating this spiraling roadbed out into the salt lake. Now, the sculpture is not static in the way that it interacts with nature. Over the years, the lake has repeatedly submerged and then revealed it as the water levels fluctuate. So the sculpture is sort of constantly evolving as it drowns and rises with a new incrustation of salt crystals. Um, so the artist ordered that no maintenance be performed on this structure because a big part of the work is that change. It's, it's kind of highlighting the fact that over time um, the sculpture is vulnerable to the elements and it will never be the same as it was the day before. Not all earthworks are made on an enormous scale. The British artist Andy Goldsworthy creates both intimate and large-scale site-specific structures out of grass, rocks, leaves, flowers, bark, snow, ice, and water, and other natural materials. Um, he kind of puts the element of time at the center of his works. Um, he's sort of interested in how the work would change slowly over time and he tries to embrace those changes as part of the ongoing life of his sculptures. Um, Goldsworthy makes earthworks that are ephemeral um, again out of fleeting materials that he collects from nature. Um, many of his works last no more than a few hours before the wind scatters them, the tide sweeps them away, or the sun melts them. For example, Japanese maple on the right of the screen here consists of a ring of leaves invisibly stitched together and placed in a rocky pool supported by a briar ring. This piece draws attention to the splendor of nature through its unrivaled vibrancy in the leaves with their sort of red hue, configured to contrast with the gray of the stones, almost as if they had arranged themselves naturally. As an environmentalist as well as an artist, Goldsworthy meticulously creates his pieces, then photographs them before they disintegrate and return to nature due to the impact of time and weather. In Two Stones, America, and Scotland, Goldsworthy used red and yellow leaves, placing them into depressions of similar looking stones which he found in upstate New York and in Scotland. And then later, the, those leaves dried and then blew away in the wind. Um, Goldsworthy says that he tries to go into nature every day and make something from whatever he finds. And he's careful not to leave any trace or damage what is there. He only uses the natural materials. He doesn't bring in any additional materials. Um, again, part of that sort of environmentalist outlook. Um, again, he does document his works using photographs, sometimes videos, as you'll see in the documentary that you're watching this week. Um, and this helps him to sort of record the work's disappearance over time as nature erases it. Um, he once wrote, time and change are connected to place. Real change is best understood by staying in one place. Um, so he's using these singular sort of site-specific sculptures to mark or to record change over time or disappearance over time. Somewhat similar to calendars today, a medieval book of hours was filled with prayers that corresponded to the times of day and tracked the months of the year. The now famous French illuminated manuscript known as the Très Riches Hours, or the Most Sumptuous Hours, um, was made by the Limbourg brothers, three brothers from the city of Limbourg, um, for the Duke of Berry. This book is unique for its prominent inclusion of the labors of peasants, although one of the Duke's castles also remains prominent in the background of each monthly scene. Um, on the page for March, which is on the left on this slide, crops are being planted and a man in the front directs an ox while plowing the same fields that will be harvested in the September scene. Um, the page for September shows grapes being harvested at the um, Chateau de Saumur, 
to make the region's celebrated wine. Some figures show the drudgery of the work as they bend down, including one in the lower center who is bent over showing his underwear in a sort of humorous way. Uh, the hemisphere at the top of each panel shows the solar chariot with Apollo, the sun god, and the relevant signs and degrees of the zodiac. The stages of human life are often linked to weather, seasons, times of day, and other natural occurrences and landscape elements. Thomas Cole, a 19th century landscape painter, was intent on using the genre of landscape to communicate universal truths about human existence, the passage of time, the natural world, and religious faith. His Voyage of Life series from 1839 to 1840 includes four works, Childhood, Youth, Manhood, and Old Age. This series traces the life and religious journey of an archetypal every man along the river of life, which flows through each canvas, reflecting life's twists and turns, while the seasons and times of day in each composition mirror the different stages of life. In childhood, a golden boat emerges from a dark cave, symbolizing a mysterious earthly womb. A happy infant reaches out to the world in wonder and naivety, while an angelic figure guides the boat forward through a scene of fertile beauty bathed in rosy light. In youth, the young boy begins to take control of the boat, steering through this lush green landscape while his guardian angel watches from the shore as he strikes out boldly towards this aerial castle in the distance, oblivious to the increasing turbulence of the river. This canvas is meant to be symbolic of the prime of life and the adolescent ambition for fame and glory. In manhood, the man, now mature, faces nature's fury. He's losing control of his life and he's plagued by self-doubt. He's barreling towards these violent rocky rapids, symbolizing the challenges of adulthood. He seemingly has no way to steer around them or to stop himself. He clasps his hands together, pleading for help, even divine intervention, as his guardian angel watches from high up in the clouds. In the final canvas, Old Age, the stream of life trickles into the ocean of eternity. All signs of the natural world or corporeal existence have been cast aside as the man floats into eternity in his broken vessel, seeing his guardian angel for the first time as he gazes out towards the soft light between the clouds and another angelic being in the distance waits to welcome him to eternity. So with this series, we have not only a representation of the different times of day and the different seasons from early morning to um, you know full sun dusk and evening um, we also have spring kind of through maybe early fall as well but we also see those different stages of life stages that every human being kind of experiences um, early adolescence, adulthood, old age, and eventually death. Many artists throughout history have used their works to sort of grapple with the almost unfathomable ideas of death and mortality, um, sometimes using the works to maybe better understand these universal experiences or using the works to express their own anxieties about mortality. Um, in 17th century Dutch still life paintings, Vanitas artworks were based on the theme of fleeting nature of life. Um, this Vanitas still life with glass globe by Peter Claes is a perfect example. So the word Vanitas refers to vanity or excessive pride in or admiration of one's own appearance or achievements. Um, Sometimes it's also kind of referring to materialism, both physical limitations and the desire to own possessions, as well as inevitable mortality. Now, still life images, because they depict inanimate objects, really give the artist the chance to display a great degree of technical ability using um, trompe l'oeil or sort of visual illusions to trick viewers into thinking that they are seeing a real scene. The passage of time is suggested in Vanitas paintings um, using various symbolic objects. So, for example, here we have a time 
piece, as well as a skull, which is an obvious memento mori, which literally means remember that you must die. Um, we also see a tipped glass and a cracked walnut that tell us that a person was probably just here enjoying wine and food, but now for whatever reason, upon short notice, they are gone. Um, the instrument reminds us that music is also transient. It's not fixed in time, and it will at some point end just like human life. Um, Clace includes his own presence in this painting by showing his reflection in the glass ball on the left side of the table. The tiny self-portrait displays the artist's virtuosity, and it also simultaneously expresses the fragility of life because the ball could easily roll off the table and shatter. However, it also sort of serves as a challenge to death because through this portrait, the painter will live on after his own death through his works. The American photorealist artist Audrey Flack built on this Dutch tradition of Vanitas. Um, in addition to commenting on human mortality, Marilyn Vanitas is an homage to the American film actress Marilyn Monroe. The photograph on the right is reflected in the mirror on the left, showing Monroe's public persona as a blonde beauty. Mirrors in art often symbolize the transience of youth, beauty, and life. As with similar objects in Clay's work on the previous slide, the calendar, clock, and hourglass further represent the passage of time. They too are reminders of the brevity of life, as are the burning candle, the flower, and the fruit, all of which only last a short period of time. The hyper-realistic colors here and the floating objects give it an otherworldly quality, a dramatic contrast to the objects that symbolize the passage of time. By including a childhood portrait of herself with her brother, the artist further wishes to remind herself and the viewer that the pleasures of life are fleeting, just like those of the movie star. Um, the mirrored compact makeup and pearls refer to Marilyn Monroe's beautiful mask to the world and again kind of remind us that earthly beauty fades. Um, this particular work was made about 15 years after the celebrity died in 1962, again helping to sort of preserve the past in the face of earthly beauty, to reflect the glamorization of famous figures, and to promote art as a response to the inevitability of times passing and so to death. So you have a work that utilizes stop motion animation um, to sort of capture how how um, time passes and how that affects the relationships that we have during our lives, um, how those who are left behind uh, grieve for those who have um, passed on and um, kind of the experience that we go through in situations like that. Um, so this particular um, little video. I will post a link so that you guys can watch it for yourselves. Um, but this was a song that was written by Tim Booth, um, and he wrote the song for, or excuse me, about the death of his mother. And then the song is performed by an artist named James, um, and it's titled Moving On. Uh, and the stop motion music video was made by an artist named Ansley Henderson. Um, so stop motion animation is also known as stop frame animation. Uh, commonly it uses clay, so sometimes called claymation. Um, although in this particular video they use wool um, or string. Um, but the technique is to um, move the object in small increments between individually photographed frames. And so then when you run those frames together, it creates the illusion of continuous movement. Um, so, well, when you watch the film, I think you'll see um, what a nice sort of representation of the uh, passage of time that this film is. Um, and, you know, really listen to the lyrics. It, these are pretty, pretty um, poignant as well, I think. 
So one of the most common wishes that humans make is to speak to those who are no longer here with us, uh, to be able to ask advice or ask for guidance, to just sit down and chat with the people that we have lost and compare our experiences or just tell them about what we have become since they since they um, have been gone. Tell them that we miss them and kind of explain or answer questions or ask questions. Um, and so here we have a work by the artist Meta Warwick Fuller um, that kind of deals with this idea. Um, this work is titled Talking Skull. And so we have a, a young man who is kneeling um, and he's nude in a very sort of vulnerable state. And he kneels in front of a skull. And so this is sort of the wish come true. He's having this opportunity to communicate with someone that he has lost. Um, but note the facial expression on the figure here. The brow is very bunched. The mouth is sort of slightly open. Uh, the head is slightly tilted. It really sort of communicates this emotion, this longing to connect with someone who is gone. And here it seems that the boy is hearing an answer to his to his questions or to his wishes. Um, and so this sort of embodies that universal desire for communication beyond the boundaries of the living realm. Um, and so Fuller was an African-American artist. And so as a specifically African-American work, this work also also addresses the very traumatic rupture between um, African Americans and their ancestral African cultures caused by the transatlantic slave trade. Um, so Fuller was born in 1877. They pursued art training in the United States and in Europe, and throughout their career, they really sought um, they sought out themes that helped black Americans reconnect with or find pride in, excuse me, um, find pride in their African heritage. Art making for the purposes of ancestral veneration has um, a very long history because one of the ways that we as human beings make sense of our place within the world is to explore our connections to the past. Um, ideas of lineage and of ancestors are very prominent in um, works of visual art. Um, ancestral veneration occurs across cultures. Here we have um, photographs from various Day of the Dead celebrations. Um, this festival has Aztec and Mayan roots. People generally visit the graves of their loved ones and adorn them with flowers and food, um, essentially temporary art installations for the purpose of connecting the living with the dead. In China, family shrines and ancestral shrines receive regular offerings. Um, they're given food and drink and spirit money. Um, there's a special holiday, the King Ming Festival, in which um, offerings are made to these spirits. Um, this is also sometimes known as the Ghost Festival. Um, and then here on the right, we have a portrait of the Emperor Yongqing. He reigned between about 1722 and 1735. And I've included this here because at the death of an ancestor, a Chinese family would commission a portrait to be made, and then they would hang the portrait within the family shrine for veneration. Uh, so here with the emperor's portrait, it shows his power, it shows his wealth. He's seated on this gilded throne and dressed in rich textiles. Um, the cushion of the throne is covered in rich textiles as well, uh, as is the carpet. There are dragons stitched into the designs on his robe, which again are symbolic of his power. Um, and so it a portrait like this would be installed into an ancestor shrine, something similar to what's in the picture on the left. Um, but then the descendants would burn incense and bow before the ancestors, um, asking them for protection and for guidance.
In many African cultures, an important connection between past and present exists in the reverence people show for their ancestors and the nature spirits that they believe influence their lives. Um, the rituals people in certain cultures perform are as crucial to their livelihood as the chores and tasks of daily life, and it is important to link oneself to ancestors. Um, this is often done through various types of artwork. Um, so this particular painted wooden maternity sculpture is called a femba, and it is from a group of Congo peoples, probably the Yombe people, um, and it shows a woman kneeling as she holds a bowl in one hand and supports a child with the other. This sculpture is a simple representation of a routine daily event. A woman goes to collect water and takes her child with her, but the artist has given us clues that it has further significance. Um, she is frequently thought to symbolize an ancestor that protects and nourishes the village. This example is unlike other Fimba figures because they usually show the woman nursing the child. The bowl and the child may be gifts bestowed by the ancestor or god, or they may represent sacrifices the woman is prepared to make. White paint, as has been used on this sculpture, often identifies nature spirits who provide um, role models for the living members of the community. They must honor their ancestors with gifts of sustenance and with children who will continue the traditions they have worked so hard to establish. Contemporary American artist Jillian Mayer was inspired by genealogy. Um, she wanted to sort of explore what her descendants would know about her in the future. She said, quote, we only know our grandparents as old, end quote. Her musings resulted in the work, I Am Your Grandma, a minute long video that went viral on YouTube with more than 4.6 million views as of July, 2021. Like a self-portrait in the future tense, the video mixes fast-paced shots of Mayer wearing 13 different masks and costumes and rapping over a catchy tune. Um, she says, one day I'm going to have a baby and you will call her mom. That baby will have a baby and you will have this song to know that I am your grandma. This is a gift I give to you, like I already said, that there was a time I was aware that one day I'd be dead. I wish we could have met. I would have loved you so but you are in the future you get love by video i am your grandma this is sort of funny but also somewhat unnerving because this message to her future unborn grandchild shows the artist to be anything but old mayer is interested in what she calls legacy leaving and she acknowledges the importance of quote using technology to deal with identity in the video, viewers can also find visual references to figures from art history, such as Pablo Picasso's images of the Harlequin, a comic figure from European theater tradition, as well as from pop culture, for example, the singer Lady Gaga's Mother Monster. Um, these are based on the artist's experiences and imagination. Now, whether or not we recognize the specific references, I Am Your Grandma embraces play, ambiguity, and uncertainty as ways to connect with the real world, a world in which attachments are sometimes made to people we have never met, including distance or long dead relatives, characters in theater or art, and favorite singers. Artists confront many often unanswerable questions about death, mortality, and immortality. After we die, do we leave the world of the living? Is it important for the body to stay intact? Is there a place to which the soul goes? Um, images of death in art capture the body as it is remembered and, in a sense, can allow the person's memory to become immortal. During the Renaissance, Christian artists often depicted the very damaged body of Christ after his crucifixion. These images were important because they emphasized what Christians believed to be the miraculous nature of Christ's later resurrection, and also the concept of eternal life after death, which is at the core of Christianity. 
The Italian artist Andrea Montegna created a direct and intimate view of the body in this work, Dead Christ. Because Montegna has dramatically foreshortened the scene, we are first confronted by the stigmata, or the wounds that Christ suffered um, while hanging on the cross in his feet, and then further into the picture in his hands. His body is covered in careful drapery, which extends away from us on this marble slab, suggesting a tomb. Beyond the muscular torso, we can see Christ's lifeless face, and to his side, we see the Virgin Mother and Mary Magdalene, who are mostly cropped out of the picture. Um, their grief adds to the atmosphere of the scene, but the artist focuses our attention on the immediacy of Christ's body and his death. Now, perhaps because we are somewhat detached from death or out of a sense of propriety, contemporary images of the deceased are not nearly as common as they have been in the past. Photographs of the deceased can be especially shocking today because we no longer have such a direct relationship with death. In the past, loved ones most often died at home rather than in hospitals, and bodies were laid out for burial by family members rather than funeral homes. The American artist Andres Serrano made a series of photographs in a morgue in which the subjects are identified only by the manner of their deaths. The composition of this photo, the morgue, gun murder, with the feet pointing away from the viewer is almost a direct opposite of Mantegna's dead Christ on the previous slide. Um, here, the dark background, the white bandages and body bag, and the strong lighting create a sense of drama and contrast. The formal beauty of the image itself kind of contradicts the shocking reality that this person, whose identity we will never know, was I want to show murdered. You a unique form of funerary art um, that is a sort of ritual um, process as well. Um, so. This occurs amongst the Buende people. Um, this is a subgroup of the Congo peoples who occupy um, the Democratic Republic of Congo and the Republic of Congo and other areas of Central Africa. Um, but when an important man dies, um, he can undergo a type of mummification process that is known as Niambo. Um, and so the two images here, this is the final um, object that is created through this process. Um, now, I don't have the dimensions on the screen, but in the next image, you'll see these, um, see these in scale. These are over life size. Um, so the deceased body is smoked um, and dried to remove all of the liquids and from what i understand this is overseen by the women of the community um, but once the body is prepared it is then wrapped in many layers of textiles so first it's wrapped in crude cheap materials such as raffia mats um, and then as it as it kind of gets to the outer layers it's wrapped in meters upon meters of brightly colored cloths so the nicer textiles are closer to the surface um, a framework made of cane is placed around um, the figure to reinforce the shape and to create the limbs and the head um, these are stuffed with grasses and cotton and then sewn shut um, and then the whole thing is bundled together with a red um, fabric blanket. So for the Congo peoples, red is a color associated with the mediating powers of the dead. Um, and so these resulting figures, um, again, these are over life size, usually about eight to nine feet tall. Um, these are considered to be intermediaries between the living and the deceased or the spirits um, of the dead. Um, and so the makers of these Niambo figures, they studied the corpse of the deceased very carefully and noted things like um, tattoos, scarification, filed teeth, anything individualizing, um, because Overall, these are symbolic portraits, so they want to be able to decorate the exterior um, 
in a way that helps to identify who it is. Um, <clears throat> so this was a practice that really flourished in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, and so here you can see a few photographs of these Niambo figures in procession. So this gives you an idea of scale. Um, you can see the figures next to human beings. Um, but how are these used? Well, Wende funerals are rather lively events. They include lots of dancing and lots of singing. And that is even more true if a Niambo is present at a funeral. Um, dancing will take place for a number of successive nights in and around the village. And then on the day of internment, all the dancing stops. Um, a generous feast is given to honor those who donated cloth for the burial and the creation of the Niambo. And then the figure is um, processed through the village uh, along with a special orchestra. So in the central photo, we have the Niambo figure in the middle with um, with funerary attendants to the sides on the left of the photo. In the bottom left corner, you can see part of a slit gong. Um, and then the person behind that is holding um, holding a ngoma drum. And um, then beside them is another person holding a side blown trumpet. Um, so the procession of a niambo might include hundreds of people who are playing instruments, singing and dancing. Um, and so this procession guides the figure to the grave. And if I remember correctly, they lower it into the grave so that it is standing inside um, the grave. And when its feet touch the bottom, everyone in the crowd lets out a great cry and they all simultaneously jump up into the air um, to symbolically mark the completion of the soul's journey into the underworld. Um, and so then these figures are buried. Um, and so again, they become intermediaries between the living people of the community or of the village and the deceased spirits. Um, and so they sort of connect the different stages or different um, moments in the life cycle. Um, now, if you notice on these figures, they often have illustrations on the chest or on the abdomen. Um, so this is a cosmogram. And so a Congo cosmogram is an illustration of how these people understand the universe to function. Generally, it is a circle or a diamond that is divided into quadrants. And so the upper half is um, the living realm, the lower half is the spirit realm. And so these Niambo often have this cosmogram illustrated on their abdomen or on their chest. And then if you also notice, their arms are also positioned very specifically so that one arm is up and one arm is down. Um, so this indicates they are existing within both the spirit realm and the living realm at the same time. So that kind of symbolizes their status as um, mediators between the two realms. Many artists also create works that can challenge us intellectually and emotionally to grapple with the finality of death. And oftentimes, some of the most moving works were created to honor someone who was loved and who has passed away. Um, Japanese artist Motoi Yamamoto expresses the painful loss of his younger sister who died of brain cancer through installations of complex patterns made using salt. The labyrinths that he creates symbolize the elaborate and intricate organization of the brain. Yamamoto's use of salt as a medium is also symbolic since the mineral serves a dual purpose in life and death. Salt is needed for a living body to function, yet it is also used to preserve the dead. 
Yamamoto's painstaking and meticulous process of creating these works puts him in an almost meditative state as he explores grief, memory, and time. It is physically demanding as he is seated on the ground, carefully pouring salt over a period of several weeks. When the process is complete, he destroys the pattern, acknowledging the intertwining relationship between creation and destruction and the passage of time as well. Visitors to these installations are invited to take small jars of the salt and dump them into the ocean where the regenerative cycle of nature will continue again.